Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Seeing nods and thumbs up? Good. Um, I, I'm really grateful for Peter's presentation preceding mine. I'm uh, with the Colorado Water Trust, and I'm here to talk to you about a strategy that we implemented in order to address the drought in the state of Colorado. Um, I, I think in order to kick the talk off, what I want to share with you is that while these are Colorado tools um, and used in the Colorado way through the Colorado system, um, it's important to note that I think that these kinds of concepts can be transferable. Enabling conditions in different states differ, obviously, but keep in mind this idea of market-based and voluntary flow restoration. And the, um, I'm also thankful to the Tamarisk Coalition for pulling this conference together and giving us an opportunity to talk about something which is my understanding from those folks you guys don't get to talk about a lot, which is flow restoration. And that is our all day, every day, 24-7, what we do at the Colorado Water Trust. Um, so who are we? Um, we are a nonprofit organization that was formed in 2001 with the mi mission of restoring and pr protecting stream flows throughout the state of Colorado. That is fancy for we buy water for fish. Um, and we, over the years, have, we started off as a small organization with a single staff person and we've grown over the years to try and do this um, thing that we spend every day trying to figure out, which is how do we crack open the environmental flow market in the Colorado River Basin. Um, we have, a, 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 it's essentially our organization has been called a nonprofit kind of consulting firm for the environment. We have two technical experts, one with an engineering background, we have three attorneys, we have a communications um, person and we sort of put together the nonprofit model with the consulting world model in order to be the sort of consulting group for the environment in Colorado. Our board of directors is a series of water attorneys and water consultants that have spent much of their career moving water out of rivers and they will tell you this themselves. They participate in and are hopeful for the success of the Colorado Water Trust because they want to give back to the system that they've been working in for so long to help develop supplies for their um, clients. So I'm going to start with an overview of the state of Colorado's in-stream flow program. Um, I think most folks here know that uh, the in-stream flow program is managed by a state agency. They are the only game in town in terms of protecting water in river in reaches. Um, in 1973, the in-stream flow program was formed. It has a very measured goal. The goal, um, when the legislation was adopted, the legislature recognized the need to correlate the activities of mankind with some reasonable preservation of the natural environment. It's a pretty mellow charge. It's not really out there. And the idea was that they wanted to balance the playing field and kind of tuck this program into a system that would be able to accept it. And in some ways, the program, I think, has been really successful at this because lots of people think it hasn't gone far enough and lots of people think it's gone too far. Um, the legislation, the underlying legislation that created the program gave the Water Conservation Board um, two different tools. The first tool is to appropriate new water rights. So they go and develop a new supply just like anyone else does. It's for a reach in a river from an upper point to a lower point for a specified amount. It typically has a season of use associated with it. It has all the attributes um, that, a, that a water right has for out of river uses, um, except for it's intended for in river uses. The other tool that they have is the acquisitions tool, and that's where our organization partners really closely with this agency in order to do the work we're doing. The acquisitions program allows the Water Conservation Board to acquire water rights decreed for other purposes and move them back into the river. These two tools are significant because the appropriations process where you go and obtain a new water right from a system that has already been developed, in essence, just protects the system where it is against future development. The acquisitions tool is the tool that allows you to restore. So you can bring water back to a dry stream and actually create supply that hasn't been available due to either drought circumstances or um, uh, demand from the river. So the appropriations program protects systems where they are against future development, acquisitions program restores flow. The CWCV in the state of Colorado holds a pretty significant water rights portfolio. Um, they have nine 
1,120 miles of stream that are covered within stream flows. Um, that's about 31% of the perennial streams in the state of Colorado. The, the primary acquisition tool that the CWCB had was um, permanently moving water into the in-stream flow program. They also had no funding mechanism for it and no technical expertise um, to do those permanent transfers. So they were using a lot of the new appropriations tool and not a lot of the acquisitions tool. The drought started in 2002 and a series of different water users went to the Water Conservation Board and said, hey, we want to put water rights in your program this year. We're not going to have enough to um, grow a full crop. We're not going to have enough to do what we want to do with our water rights. Take them into your program. And the CWCB did some research and determined that it was uncertain whether or not they actually had the legal authority to protect temporary water in the in-stream flow program. So a group of bipartisan, a bipartisan group of legislators, and I'm talking both wings of both parties, came together and said, let's give them that authority. If we have water users with property interests who want to put them in the in-stream flow program, let's let them do that. So they created um, a statute that allowed the temporary transfer of water rights into the state's in-stream flow program, and it's significant for a series of reasons. Um, the process is an administrative approval process that is intended to be very quick. Um, one of the projects that we worked on in, under this um, statute, we put out a request for water on April 23rd, and by July 11th, we had an approval to use that water for in-stream flows. In Colorado, where transfers can take five to 10 years, this was the rocket docket. This was super duper fast. Um, so it allowed, the legislator created this statute to allow water rights owners to just loan water to the in-stream flow program. They could be used for 120 days a year, for three years in 10 years. So all of our leases, or almost all of our leases are um, for, th for three years in 10 years. So we get to determine what the conditions look like and use water in the program for three out of um, 10 years from the date of signing of the contract. It is an administrative approval process. That is what makes it so quick. Um, so in Colorado, typically water rights transfers need to go through a water court process, which is a litigation process. This is an administrative approval process that is fast, fast, fast. Um, and the, the, there, is a, there are a couple of limitations to the program, actually. Um, one is that the water rights that we put into the system or the CWCB acquires um, for leasing can only be used in concert with a decreed in-stream flow. So they have to have gone through obtain those purple lines in the map, the squiggly lines, those are the only places where we were able to use leased water. And we can only use water in those places um, where the, do you need to see the map? Okay. Um, we can only use water in places where those decreed in-stream flows are actually going to be short. So we are filling in a shortage. Let's say they have an appropriated in-stream flow for five CFS and our crystal ball tells us it's going to be two CFS short during a season, then we know if we can acquire two CFS, we can use that water up to the decreed amount of five CFS. Oh, there's the map. Oh, there's the map. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I saw some people scratching their heads. This is the map that shows you the location of the in-stream flow water rights in the state of Colorado. Anyone notice anything? west of the Continental Divide, or almost all of the in-stream flows. So our program was also pretty well limited to um, west of the Continental Divide. This is what the snowpack looked like in May of 2012. So we began to build this program. We, I, th I think that folks in Colorado tend to have gotten themselves through years where snow was slow to catch up. And we have sort of a reset button that occurs in February. So if we are seeing really low snowpack, sometimes it really dumps in February and March, and we generally catch ourselves up. And so I think between 2011 and 2012, we at the Water Trust were sitting thinking the February snowpack would do its magic and catch us back up again. And then we kept thinking, okay, February didn't happen as March. Could and, and the snowpack maps were getting worse and worse and worse. And they're blue when you have a lot of snowpack and they're red when you're in the danger zone. And we are watching them go from pale green to yellow into orange and, and into red. And so we decided we needed to move quickly. Um, there was a temporary loan statute on the books. We were in a drought that was gripping the entire state of Colorado. 
we were watching snowpack maps in every basin just plummet. And we said, let's build a program so that we can support the in-stream flow program by moving water into the in-stream flow program. Um, everyone is also familiar with 2002. That is a photo of an in-stream flow that is an eight CFS in-stream flow, and those are the conditions in 2002. So some rivers really, really um, took significant hits, and the idea was we would bring water to those rivers. Um, we ran this program for two years because 2012 to 2013 started to look like 20, 2011 to 2012. Um, snow wasn't catching up and we had literally just put the 2012 program to bed and we were thinking wow that was a lot of work and then all of a sudden we were watching the snowpack maps and they were doing the same thing all over again so we built the program up again um, this is what the snowpack looked like as of March 11 um, 2013 there isn't a single basin that's above average um, and but we mother nature threw some curveballs at us last year I think everyone remembers that it started snowing late in the season and then we got incredible monsoons in September. And recall that with the leasing program, we're trying to thread our water rights through a bit of a needle, a decreed in-stream flow that's water short. So we are trying to match water rights with a decreed in-stream flow that we know to be water short. Um, when, when we have basins that were at 67% of snowpack and then within a week they're at 91, um, and we were planning on putting water in streams in those areas, we have to be really, really careful about moving forward with leases because we're trying to thread that needle. This was May 18th, 2013, so we have two basins that have just plummeted into drought, and others, like the South Platte, that saw a ton of snowpack catch them right back up again. Um, the Colorado River Basin fared better, some kind of hung around in the 60s and 70s, but this landscape was the, you know, one of the most consistent topics in our office because our leasing program was premised on these temporary approvals to go shore up streams that we knew to be short, and then some weren't. Um, this is just another visual for um, snowpack, and the, it's the heavy line, the water year 2013 that you want to look at, because that's what we were looking at for um, releasing the program again in 2013. And then if you look at 2012, it's looking pretty low also. Those two red lines on the bottom are 2002 and then historic minimums. So what was our process? What did our process look like? We built a program that was intended to move quickly to allow people to know that we were available to lease water and move it back into rivers. Um, so we created both years, 2012 and 2013, this is sort of the generic process that we created, a deadline for lease offers. We used local media, we used our website, we used our email address, we had friend organizations let people know that we were available to be leasing water rights through all of their channels and networks. And then we created a deadline for people to submit a form that was on our website to say, hey, we're interested in leasing water into the program. Then we engaged in a screening process, due diligence, evidence of ownership, technical stuff. It's all the tire kicking that goes into determining whether or not a water right is suitable for transfer. We then, if we kind of made it through our screening process, we shipped the water rights out for water rights engineering to make sure that indeed our preliminary investigations that gave us the green light would give the total green light, the really technical green light. At that point, we would then have the water rights valued. We're not experts in water rights valuation, so we farm that work out. Um, and we use a, a shop that helps us uh, create opinions of value, and then we use those numbers to negotiate these transactions with the water user that's willing to put their water in the program. Um, if we can go through the negotiations, we're paying what the folks believe they're entitled to and we can negotiate the lease term, then we do all of the lease negotiations and sign the lease, at which point we submit the water right to the CWCB for review. I do need to tell you that that box, the CWCB review box should encompass all of the other boxes because this program was highly collaborated with the Water Conservation Board. We couldn't spring anything as a surprise on them. We had to be really cautious about the water rights that we were bringing them, careful, work through their process. So we're really negotiating in two different directions. We're negotiating with the folks that want to put water in the program, but we're also making sure that the water is appropriate for the CWCB. Um, it went, goes out for public comment. In 2012, it was um, a total fairy tale. We didn't receive a single public comment about any of our projects. That's really unusual in Colorado. Usually it's a total pile on anytime you want to move water and 
either folks were not paying attention or folks thought that the process was working or they just sort of wanted to sit back and see it play itself out, but we had zero comments to respond to. That was not the case with 2013. Every one of ours had comments. Um, and then uh, we get, an, then the state engineer does an approval process. And once we get the state engineer approval process, the CWCB accepts the water right, and then we're rocking and a rolling. And rocking and a rolling is also a really big part of this program because that means we're modifying head gates and deliveries under head gates. We're working with laterals. In one case, we had to build. Um, a recharge pond so that we could move some water and lag some return flows back to the river. Um, and then we paid right up front when the lease was entered into half of the funds and then we saved the other half of the funds for successful completion of the lease. Hang on, checking in on time. Okay. Um, so once we entered into the lease with folks, the only way that we can ensure that the water is going back in the river is by doing site visits and monitoring. So um, we had a lot of field visits in 2012 and 2013 to the leases that we had implemented. Um, in order for us to do this administration, we also worked really, really closely with the local water officials in Colorado. You have a state engineer office that um, presides over the entire state of Colorado. And then in each of Colorado's river basins, there is a division engineer who's responsible for the water rights in their particular division. And then below them are the folks with the boots on the ground who are moving water and responding to people saying, I'm not getting what I'm entitled to. We worked really closely with the water commissioner to implement these leases because we needed them to buy into um, injury if we were claiming injury to the leases, but also to understand how we would be reporting under them afterwards. Um, so these are some images of our site visits and some of the infrastructure that we were working with and the folks in the bottom right hand corner of the picture are actually standing in our recharge pond. Um, these leases were also heavily collaborative with the underlying landowners. We had to schedule site visits. We had to schedule site visits to implement the lease, also to ensure that the terms of the lease were being met and then to return things back in the event we had to return things back to normal once the lease was implemented. Um, we also had accounting obligations under these leases. We um, took all of the records from all of our leases and turn them into reports to give to the division engineers so that they knew two things, how the lease was operated and also how to record the leases in their books. Um, in Colorado, the books that keep track of how water rights are used are really important for the water user in order to maintain the health of their water rights. So we had to make sure that all of the reporting was done well and carefully and that we monitored and that we tracked the water and then it, presented all of that to the division engineer so that they knew how to say, check the box, yes, these things happen the way they were supposed to. There is one particular protection about these leases that is really important, and that is that when somebody enters into these leases, the fact that they weren't using their water rights for, say, an irrigation purpose or a municipal purpose didn't penalize them in the future. And so there is a recording mechanism that was intended to protect these water users. And so we combed through the records once the records were made available so that I understood, or so that we understood, um, I'm sorry, so that anyone looking at the records would understand in the future that the water rights were used in the leasing program for that particular year. And then that way the protection was afforded to them. And when we went back and looked at the records, in 2012, all four of our leases were recorded differently. So we've been working with the division engineer in, to, in order to ensure that they have a coding requirement that makes it clear that the water was used for in-stream flow purposes. This is my last slide. Um, so this is just a, a graph that shows you some statistics for the program that we found interesting. Um, we had water rights bundled and offered to us in a in packages. My recollection is that it was maybe 19 water users uh, both years. So really similar uh, interest in the program between the two years, 2012 and 2013. The number of water rights offered in those packages, however, are, are different. In 94, we processed, I'm sorry, in 2012, we processed 94 water rights. In 2013, 130. 56 passed that initial screen, that first box that I told you about, 86 in 2013 passed through there, 13 passed through our engineering review, uh, 34 in 2013 passed through the engineering review and kind of fast forwarding through all of that, 
we ultimately put three leases on the ground that were specifically ours, although four went forward in 2012, and in 2013, three leases. And um, in 2012, we were offered water rights in six of the seven water divisions in the state of Colorado, and in 2013, four of the seven. We ultimately leased in divisions five and six, that's the Colorado River Basin and the Yampa White, and then in 2013, four, five, and six, so throw the Gunnison in there, and we did a lease in the Gunnison. Um, and that is it for me, and I'm also out of time. <laughs> Do you actually pay for the leases? You didn't talk about values. I, I, it was only 20 minutes and I talked really fast. <laughs> Um, yes, actually, and the fundraising strategy behind this leasing program has been of interest to folks. In 2012, we decided in March we would do the program, and we released it on April 23rd. And between that time, I went to my board of directors and said, we have this totally harebrained, wild, crazy idea to do a statewide request for water. And they said, are you nuts, and how are you going to pay for it? And for the first time ever, I said something to the effect of, I think there's interest and you have to trust me. We were moving so fast. I don't know if any of you folks out there have state or federal funding, and if you work for the state or the feds, plug your ears. Um, state and federal funding can't work quickly enough to fall in a window where you decide you're going to do something in March, and then you implement it in April, at the end of April. So we were looking at a 100% private funding strategy for this uh, process. And we, um, it was privately funded both in 2013, or 2012 and 2013 with a series of different really um, quick adopters, people who saw it and said, this is great, we should fund this, we need to make this happen, we'll seed it, let's go. Um, the Gates Family Foundation was a really early adopter. They invested really significantly both years. We had, we had an anonymous private donor give us $50,000 both years. The Walton Family Foundation was significantly invested in the program. We had National Geographic invest in the program and then tell stories about the leases. There's a really cool video on their website if you want to look up Yampa Water Lease and National Geographic. They did a fabulous job with the video. Um, Bonneville Environmental Foundation funded the um, projects both years and did a really nice job using the big bullhorn that they're developing to tell people about this project. I think the nicest thing about it is that it started to crack open the environmental flow market. Thank you.